What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. Well, that truth that Jesus is the key to joy has been our theme, our focus. It's where our attention has been over the months of the fall in 2021. And as aforementioned, today's the last day where we kind of wrap up this verse-by-verse -verse teaching through this book. So if you're not joyful and you've been with us, it's kind of your fault. Like you didn't do with the Bible. No, I'm just teasing. Like there's still, obviously, there's always time to make choices. But like this book, the why behind this book for this season. Did you know that every day is unique? You say, oh, yeah, I know. My two-year-old knows that. Yeah, I know you know that. But do you live that way? That there's only ever one Sunday, November 14th, 2021, in Gulf Breeze, Florida, at 11.29 a.m. You get one shot. Sure, there's, there's rhythms, there's similarities to maybe last Sunday to a certain degree. But never again will the same people be in the same room with the same environmental, political, spiritual, emotional, relational, mental, physical dynamics that are in play right now. This is it. You get one shot at what you're going to do with today. One shot. That's what makes life so fun and so precious. It's because it's not promised. And what you have now, you have now, but you may not have it in two seconds. Who knows? Who knows what's coming for us? You could be here for another two hours in this sermon, or we could finish on time. Nobody knows. No, we won't do that. But, but life goes by quickly. And you know, what was it, Lenin that said, like, life is what happens while you're making plans, or somebody like that said that, but it goes fast. There's always dynamics that distract, or that can cause a depressed state. But, but let me have your attention. Hear me on this. It doesn't have to be your story. We learn God's Word because I believe with all my heart, head and hands, that His Word is living and active. That's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. For that day and age, that made a lot of sense. Stronger than any virus, if you want to think of it that way. It's more powerful than that, more potent than that, more viral than that, I guess you could say. The Word of God is powerful. And it has been given to us, according to Paul's writings to Timothy, to instruct us how to live well in Jesus. Jesus said in the 10th verse of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, I have come so that you would go to church and live a moral, deistic life. No. I have come that you may have life and that it may be abundant. So life's meant to be good? Even on this side of eternity where everything's broken, life can still be good? You better believe it. Life can be a life of joy. Hope, peace, you can actually experience this gift of God known as self-control, where emotions don't rule you. How that person treated you on Highway 98 doesn't affect your temperament. It's possible. Not plausible, but possible. Does that make sense? No. It's possible to have a life of resiliency in that which matters, and a hurricane can't take that. A divorce can't destroy that. Nothing can take away that which Jesus gives to you. But listen to me. Your relationship with Jesus is relational. Isn't that rocket science? Like, and you know something about relationship? It's volitional. Choice is there. 
Relationships may be born, but the only way they develop is over time and through investment and reciprocation. That's how relationships deepen. That's how they grow. And Paul, the author of this little letter, he's writing to people he actually cares about. Can you believe that? Like people in church, he actually liked them. Like there was actually a relationship there. He cared for them. And in the letter to the Philippians, it's some of the most tender of all of Paul's writing. Some of the most treasured verses in the New Testament come from these four chapters. The central message is joy. And that Jesus is, is the key. To joy. I mean, 19 times, 19 times, Paul references this concept and dynamic of joy. And you may say, well, what does this mean, joy? Well, listen to what one biblical author, commentator wrote about joy. He said, biblical joy is choosing to respond. Let me say this again so you don't miss it. Biblical joy is choosing to respond to external circumstances, stuff that you necessarily can't control, with inner contentment and satisfaction. Because we know God will use these experiences to accomplish His work in and through our lives. So you mean, you've heard this, to rejoice is a choice? Better believe it. You mean attitude is my responsibility? Absolutely. I like David Guzik. Good guy, smart guy. This is what he says. Joy is the exhilaration of being right with God and consciously walking in his love and care. See, this is the deal. That truth didn't change no matter what the weather was today. I heard it was supposed to freeze. It didn't freeze. Well, my joy is not. No, no, no. Listen, no matter what happens today, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're still going to heaven. That's a good day. Because your worst day with Jesus beats every day without him. Every day. Joy is available to those who want it. This is the book of Philippians. What do you mean by that? Paul uses the word mind ten times, think five times, and remember once for a total of 16. See that math right there? Ten, five, one. 16 times he references this lump that's right between our ears. He says, you want joy? Outlook often determines outcome. Are you negative? Stop it. You can change that. Attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions. The examples you lead by, the friends, the goals, the habits, the interests, the joys of your life. You have an element of influence over those. No one controls everything. But you are called to steward yourself well. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, mentally. How are you stewarding that which God gave you? Well, so-and-so did this, and so-and-so... No, no, no. You are responsible for you. Steward yourself well. This is the book of Philippians. Warren Wearsby, he wrote this. Philippians is a Christian psychology book of sorts, but based solidly on Christian doctrine. Not a person's study, research, experiences, based on what the Bible has to say. And listen to what he says. It is not a shallow self-help book. That tells the reader, listen to Jack Johnson, just everything's gonna work out, you know, upbeat. Bob Marley, it, right? No worries. No, that's not what this is. It is a book that explains the mindset, listen to this, please. The mindset a believer must have if he or she is to experience joy in a world that's filled with trouble. Do you know what that means? It means you don't walk an aisle and you get like heaven. Um, Pixie dust from Tinkerbell, and everything's going to be all right. Now, from now on, everything is just going to be rainbows and roses in life. Relationship with God is developed. 
begins with new birth and new life. But as you trust Him, as you walk with Him, as you actually obey Him, then the fruit of joy and peace and long-suffering and self-control begins to germinate and bear fruit. You want great fruit? Then focus on deep roots. That's how it works. You want to have a life that's fruitful? Play the long game, not the short game. Because the deeper the root, the more ability that tree has to hold massive fruit. I love what Greg Laura used to say. He's a pastor on the West Coast. He said, I could care less about being a big church. We're about being a healthy church. Healthy church. That's all we've ever wanted to be. And you know what the great thing is? At least spiritually speaking, I don't know all your physical dynamics and everything else that's going on. You can be healthy. You can. There's certain ingredients, Bible reading, obedience, Prayer, giving, serving, witnessing. These are things that you can do that will lend themselves over time to a healthy spiritual life. So the the book of Philippians is all about the mindset that we must have in order to experience joy. In chapter 1, we're going to put this up on the screen, he talks about a singleness of mind that you must have through circumstances. Has anyone in the room, or maybe in another room, you can mention this on a chat window or something, that you've ever maybe had a challenging day or circumstances didn't go your way? One guy, right here, I like this guy. You and I, we connect. Everyone else, there's a song by Imagine Dragons, Bad Liars, that's what they are. Anyway, circumstances, nobody can control them, right? You think you can, and then you get on an airplane or something, I got no control here, this guy's in charge, what are we going to do? But listen, A singleness of mind. That's what Paul writes. Listen to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who has begun a good work in you, it might work out. No, he will complete it. He who has begun the work in you, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But some of us might say, but for me to live is comfort. Or zip code envy, like I need to get to that place where everything will align. Like, no, for me to live is Christ. See, Paul did not look at his relationship with God through the lens of circumstance. He looked at circumstance through the lens of his relationship with God. And you know what happened to him then? Circumstance was then subservient to him. He was not subservient to it. Because his goal was simple. My goal is God's glory and others' good. So come what may, that circumstance can be used for that. That's how you beat it. That's how circumstance doesn't wag your life around like tail wagging the dog. What are you going for? If you say, well, I'm actually going for my comfort. I, want, I just want to be served in my marriage. I'd like for my job, I'd just like to continue to get promoted and get recognized. Are all those things wrong and bad? No, they're good things. Reputation, relationship, resource, these aren't bad things. These are good things. But once you make a good thing the God thing of your life, the master passion, you rob the good thing of the thing that God intended it for. And it becomes odd to you. Because listen, resource, relationship, reputation, the right residence. I can't think of any other R's right now. These things gratify. They do not satisfy. There's nothing wrong with, with an appropriate level of gratification. I mean, that coffee, hopefully it brings you some gratification. Otherwise, why are you drinking it? Like, hopefully there's something to it. But does it satisfy? Nothing does. Except for one. Jesus. See, here's the deal. Everything else in life is like gravel into the Grand Canyon of your soul. Why doesn't this satisfy? It's not designed to. It's designed to bring gratification. Jesus, your designer, is the one who has been designed for you in relationship to finally bring satisfaction of soul. Where you can say, circumstances? I mean, hell or high water, whatever the situation is, I'm good. If God's glorified and people received good, I'm stoked. The mindset must change. 
Life is not about you. You need to spell life accurately. Joy, Jesus, others, and let him take care of you. There it is. There's joy. That's how I find it. That's how I navigate circumstance. Now, that's easy. You'll never be tested in that. Once you get that lesson down today, you'll always be joyful. No, right? Like, circumstance keeps coming, and you keep going back to that same lesson. I mean, that's what chapter 2 is about. And chapter 2, it's not so much about a singleness of mind, but a submissiveness of mind. Why? Because relationships can be dicey. Anyone ever had a relationship that you wish was just a little bit better? Me and that guy, we're, we're the only two, right? Yeah, I mean, isn't there someone like, yeah, I, I, that could be better. I mean, that, my, maybe that could be developed. Well, how? He gives four examples. Four examples in chapter 2. Jesus is the example of verses 1 through 11. He speaks about himself, Paul does, in verses 12 through 18. And then verses 19 through 24, he talks about Timothy. And then verses 25 through 30, he talks about Epaphrodites. And he says, listen, here's what all these individuals have in common. They're submitted to God in the relationship. And the relationship is about adding value to the other person. I heard a book on uh, Audible yesterday, and they mentioned some statistics about how few relationships are really about the other person. That when you get a text from someone, it's usually something about what they need or somehow you can contribute to their life or something. He said, friendships that actually just call about nothing (laughs) or just a text to bring encouragement are so increasingly rare. Relationships have become transactional just exchanging monologues. There's no ability to really dialogue or just exchanging goods and services, time and whatever. It's hollow. It's hollow. You want real relationship? Make it about others. I know it doesn't make sense. And I'm not talking about developing kind of this dynamic where you have codependency. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But what I am saying in relationships, give preference to one another. Outdo one another. You want to compete in showing honor to the other person. Seek to platform the other person so they do well. They get their needs met. They get to go on the trip. Yeah, that's counterintuitive. But I'm supposed to do me, right? Live my truth. Well, what happens when you're good and they're good doesn't work out for good for anybody. There's got to be some sort of standard. The standard for relationships is others. I know that doesn't make sense. But try it for a week. See what happens. What if you lay down your rights for their good? What would life look like? People don't exist for you. You exist for them. This takes submission. This is hard. But it's the key to joy. It's how Jesus did it. Read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. He did not consider equality with God something to cling to. But he humbled himself, became a servant. You want to know how you're on the pathway to service, of like where you're aligning in that pathway of joy? How do you know? When you're like, man, maybe I'm kind of serving the Lord. It's when someone treats you like a servant, and it doesn't impact you. Hey, that person didn't recognize me, didn't open the door for me, didn't didn't even know my name. That's okay. Jesus does. Jesus does. Submissiveness of mind, chapter 3, which we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks, Paul talks about this, this spiritual mindset, right? Because there, there, there are so many things in life to be living for, but in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14, he says, I don't count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, I'm reaching forward toward the things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that chapter, you could break it down with the letter A. Like in the first 11 verses, he's kind of got this accounting mindset going. Verses 12 through 16, he's talking about athletes. In verses 17 through 21, he's talking about, well, aliens is the word, but we're not talking about the aliens that we discovered live now this year, I guess, which nobody talked about, which is amazing. But like, you know, those that are just like in a country for a little bit of time, like, oh, I'm foreign, I'm not from here. This mindset that, hey, life's not all about the things and the stuff on this planet. 
I'm pressing forward toward the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. I'm not living for that bougie camper, right? Like, that's not what I'm about. That thing's going to rust. Thief's going to come in and steal that sucker. I'm not all about that. I'm about what's coming, not what's going to go up in flames. Why would I invest in that which does not last? doesn't make any sense. Why not live for the greatest ROI, return on investment? That's heavenly. And then chapter 4, where we'll end this morning, he's talking about a steadiness of mind. Let me ask you this question. Maybe there'll be more than just me and my, my bearded friend here. Has anyone ever worried about anything in life? Yeah, okay, that one struck. Man, you guys are amazing. You, all your experiences and circumstances are good. Your relationships are golden. You guys should go plant churches. You should help some people, right? Well, we all have these challenges, but with worry, what do we need? A steadiness of mind. Isn't that hard to find nowadays? Someone on social media who's consistent? Whoa, usually it's everywhere. Well, Philippians 4, we listened to this verse uh, last week with Pastor John. Be anxious for everything, because there's so much to worry about. No, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace that God gives doesn't come from understanding. It surpasses it. That's the way this works. This is the opportunity for you to step into a lifestyle of joy, a singleness of mind, a steadiness of mind, a submissiveness of mind, a single-hearted mind. And as we close out this series today, we're going to look at verses 10 through 23 of the fourth chapter. So if you have a Bible and you're not already turned there, I'm going to ask you to turn there because I'm not going to put a lot up on the screen this, this afternoon we're just going to kind of go through the Bible. And you know what? The great thing about church is every once in a while a Christian shows up. And so if they have a Bible and you don't have a Bible, they might share with you. You might be sitting near a Christian who will say, you can, you can read my Bible with me. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 23 is where we're going to be. And we're going to look at four, I would call them like opportunities for you to step into in order to walk in joy. The first one comes from verse 10 but then also verses 14 and 16. And this is what I would say. Joy. True friends show up. This is what it's like to have a joy with friends. Look at verse 10. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. And then verse 14. Even so, You've done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this, and he planted a lot of churches. He said, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help more than once. More than once. I don't know who this guy is. Herbert Humphrey, maybe somebody does. Hubert Humphrey, but he said this, the greatest gift of life is friendship. Thomas Aquinas, I know who that is. He said, there's nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship. Set yourself in the sandals of the Apostle Paul. He's in prison, potentially awaiting his death day. It's probably the last bit of communication he's going to have with these dear friends of his. And what's he talking about? His travel experiences? The degrees hanging up on an office somewhere that he's no longer in? He's talking about his relationships. Relationships. I'm 40. I grew up in a church that you're sitting in for the most, most of my life, or at least early life. I've been to a lot of funerals. I've officiated funerals for infants, children, students, adults, and seasoned adults. I've either participated in or officiated all those kinds of funerals. I've yet to be at one 
where someone's like, did you see that social media following of so-and-so? Did you see their camper? Did you ever go to their house? Did you ever see how clean it was? Like, none of that stuff matters. You know, some of the most awesome celebration of life I've ever been to, doesn't matter if the person's famous or barely known, but the ones that actually know the individual, what they say. And there's some that don't have a lot to say. The reputation is stellar, publicly, but personally it wasn't real. And then there's others. Hey, dad was like this. My sister was like that. Wow, that's wealth. That's available to you. It's available to you. Relationships, friendships. You know, I had the opportunity to spend some time this week with some friends. Here's a picture of three of them. It's Justin, Phil, and Rick. And you don't know these boys. I didn't know them 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, I was lost. I probably would have gone to heaven, but I had no idea what I was doing in life, none whatsoever. I was lost, bewildered. I couldn't see clearly. Things were fuzzy. Nothing made sense. I had this opportunity to live in Southern California for that which I thought would be a four-month stint. So I thought, I'll go out there to this thing called Bible College. Not really interested, but I'll go. I'm sure I can meet somebody, find some kind of job, and we'll start life over. 2.0. And yet, I've learned that community shapes identity and activity. And that if, that, you know that old phrase, show me your friends and I'll show you your future? These guys helped me. Um... They're all in pastoral ministry still, which I don't know if you know many pastors, but that's, that's a big deal after 20 years. Like, wow, you made it. You're in your 40s. You're still doing this. This is great. Let's hope for 40 more, you know, or whatever. But like, there's so many stories I could share about Justin and Phil and Rick. You know, this week I had to be in southern and central California, from basically San Diego to Santa Barbara, and it seemed like every town in between, if I could say that. But I don't have a picture of this guy, but you've met him before. His name is Nate Wagner. He's the pastor of a church called Anthem Chapel. He was here last year, or earlier this year, for a spring retreat with our high school students, did a men's event, and spoke on a Sunday morning. Well, I was scheduled to speak at Anthem Chapel a week ago today. It's the church that he pastors. I was going to be spending time with these boys at a conference. Um, But here's my situation. I can't control everything. I don't really want to, but I understand that I can't. Because as I was flying into this little area called Santa Barbara, it was super, super foggy, heavy marine layer going on right now in that area. So the pilot comes over the intercom, and even though we flew out of Dallas, we didn't go to L.A., he said, hey, ladies and gentlemen, um, well, I know we're about ready to make our descent, but we're not going to be able to do that this evening. Uh, We need to turn around and go to LAX. This is like on a Friday night. Let me tell you. The last place on earth you want to be on a Friday night. I don't even think Jesus goes to LAX, you know, on Friday night. No, you don't want to be there. It's chaos. It's crazy. Don't ever go there. Oh, bummer, man. I'm going to have to figure out how to get back to Santa Barbara. All right, it'll work out. At least, you know, the pilots, he's being responsible. We're not going to land in this fog. I'm okay with that. So we kind of make the turn. And I feel like we're not really going to 180. It's like we're going 360. So he gets back on the intercom. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we can make it. Like, what? <laughs> we just changed our whole life in this one second? Like, okay, well, I guess we're going now. All right, I don't have to figure out a rental car. Here we go. So we're starting to descend. I see the little lights on the runway. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. We made it. And then you're going down, and all of a sudden you go straight up. I was like, what is going on here? He comes back on the intercom. We can't make it. We got to go back. To, we got to go. I was like, oh, this is scary. Because like we start flying over Thousand Oaks. If you know anything about Thousand Oaks and what happened a little while ago with Kobe, it was like, oh my goodness, this is where Kobe and the fog and I don't know what to do. Um, and so I talked to my wife and said, hey, can you please find a rental car? I'm actually kind of nervous to even drive this through Camarillo Canyon and all this stuff, but what am I supposed to do? 
And then uh, Nate hears about it. He's already in bed. It's like 10 o'clock at night. He said, what's going on? I said, well, I mean, the craziest thing, does this even happen? Like, we're going to make it. No, we're not. Here we go. Like, this is my situation. And he said, I'm coming for you right now. I'm in the car. I'm headed there. So Nate, it's like an hour and a half in the fog. Don't do this. Nope, I'm already in the car. All right. So he comes, and I kind of hang out in L.A. near the International Terminal, which I'm not going to go into the details of that two hours. It's too much time. But it was very not awesome. But anyway, um, Nate shows up. He's like, man, thank you. We go get a cheeseburger. You know, because you're there. It's obligatory in and out. It's what you do. It doesn't matter what day time it is. It's got to be before, or can't be before 11 a.m. But anyway, do that thing. And we're going, and he's wanting to get home. And, you know, we're kind of near the last exit on the freeway to get, home, to get to where we need to be. And it's foggy, but red and blue lights still pierce through the fog. And as he's, like, coming, there's somebody else who thinks he's going too fast. And he has the authority to say that. It's a police officer. And so Nate, you know, he gets pulled over. And he said, you won't believe this, Neil. This is the first time I've ever been pulled over. I was like, man, I just lost a friend. You know, like, (laughs) someone who would go all the way down and come all the way up. And I won't go into all the details of what happened after that, but he is going to have to help the economy of the state of California through his citation for uh, speeding there. But that friend showed up, right? I hope he still shows up. He may not answer that phone call anymore, but, but I was in a tight spot. And you know what? That friendship, I, I had a lot of friends in my life, but I would say this about friendships. Friendships, though born, don't last if they're just born. Friendships are not born, they're made. Does this make sense? They take investment. They take consistency. They take faithfulness. They take other-centeredness. Like if you may say, I ain't got no friends. The Bible says, if you would like to have a friend, then be friendly. And then it puts a period. There it is. You ain't got no friends? Why? Maybe it's because when you talk to them, you're you're doing the me monster thing. Me, 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 me. Can you fill me up? Can you help me? He's like... That's exhausting. But if you were to show up and go, hey, how can I help you be you? What can I do to enhance your life? At first, people are like, that's weird. Stay away from that guy. Because who does that? But over time, you say, wow, that guy just kind of always helps me. Well, maybe we could be friends. You know, like, that's how it works. You want joy? True friendships show up. They show up. And I don't have a, a lot of money. I'm not like a money person, but I know some people that are. And I know some people who are money people, and they are really good to people. And it's like, man, their life is awesome. Not because so much of the money, but the people. And I know some people that have money, and they're not even like the people that they're not nearly as much as other people. And they just treat people like transactional. Does that make sense? And they, they treat them as like assets, not, not people. And they're miserable. You don't have to live that way. You can live a life of joy. Like these people in the book of Philippians. I'm going to give you some homework on a Sunday. Don't you love that? But Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 21. I want you to read that. If you're like, how, how, how am I supposed to interact with one another? Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Any friend who's bringing you into evil is no friend of yours. They don't care about you. Be at peace as much as possible, dependent upon you with everyone. I mean, do you want a good Thanksgiving when Aunt Esther asks you to pass the cranberry sauce? And you're like, Aunt Aunt Esther. Like, be kind. Give her that cranberry sauce with a little bit of potato salad. Like, here, you want that too? Like, go that extra mile. Relationships are tough. They take investment to have endurance and to have any validity to them, but you can enjoy them by living the way of Jesus. May we fight for our friends, not with them. Life's too short. The second thing we'll, we'll, we'll go through, and you go, man, second, it's 12.02. What is going to happen here? Don't worry. We're going to go through this quickly. In verses 11 through 13, And then looking at verses 19 and 20, here's the second thing we see as it relates to joy is that there's actually a secret that's learned, not discovered. What does that mean? Let's look. 
Verse 11, if you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus is the key to joy. Okay, not that I was ever in need, he says, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. See what he just said there? I've learned how to be content. I know how to live, verse 12, on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, verse 13, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And then verse 19, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father, forever and ever. Amen. What's the secret? He says, the secret is contentment. And everyone goes, ooh, I'm going to pay attention right here, because I need that. Paul says, I learned contentment. Say, oh, learning? No. No. YouTubing, that's what I know. How do you get how do you get contentment? He said this contentment is not discovered in a location or a vocation or in circumstances or in cash or in a relationship. What is contentment? Contentment is simply trusting God to meet your needs. I trust you, God. I know who you are. I'm good. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean it's kind of like a Bob Marley life? Like, don't worry, be happy, this is contentment. Like, don't worry, don't need to get a job, don't need to work hard. Like, you know, just keep it easy. Be content. Listen to me. There was no sense of complacency with Paul's contentment. You ever read anything about that guy? Like, in, in the same book, Philippians, he says, I press on to take hold of that which Jesus Christ took hold of me. He says, I press toward the goal to win the prize. Well, what do you mean? Basketball coach John Wooden once said this, that peace of mind is a direct result of knowing you did your best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. Real contentment is not being complacent with, oh, this is what, I'm okay, I'm good. It's giving your best and trusting God with the rest. Real contentment is working diligently to glorify God and for the good of others. Real contentment is like this prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. That's contentment. And that is available to you now. Right now. It's a matter of choice. You're miserable. I always know there's always extenuating circumstances. There's always an exception to the rule. But I could say this 90% of the time, you're miserable. That's your own fault. Change your attitude. Outlook determines outcome. Everyone has got it worse than someone else, and everyone could have it better than someone else. I mean, you keep looking around. You're going to waste your life. Don't do that. Contentment. Bloom where you're planted. Go for it. Give your best. Trust God with the rest. Contentment is learned. It's not discovered. Someplace. You know why the the grass is greener usually on another hill? Because there's a septic tank right under that hill. That's why. (laughs) You think it's all awesome, then you get there and go, it kind of stinks over here. Why is it all green? Oh, I didn't know it stunk. Like, that's the way it works, man. There's no place, no person, no profession where you go, oh, I'm finally happy here now. Once you find that place, you'll probably make it miserable, you know? Contentment is learned. This is the key to joy. Number three, in verses 15 through 19, you see this concept of resource, joy, I would say this about money or resource. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead of you. Ooh, I like that. What does that mean? Look at verse 15. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and traveled from Macedonia. We heard that. No other church did that. We know about that. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me more than once. Okay, we we know about all this. But I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward 
for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me from Epaphroditus. It's sort of like a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. God's paying attention to my generosity? Yeah. And this is the same with God, who takes care of me and will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which he has given to us in Christ Jesus. You know the biblical view of money? It does not belong to you. That's the biblical view of money. It belongs to God. He's given it to you to steward. That doesn't mean you don't work hard and earn. Absolutely. I don't. I mean, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. That'd be a great thing for America to learn. But like, that's what the Bible says. Like, if you don't, like, you aren't responsible. What happens when your good isn't good for another person's good? We need a standard. You can't just live by your own goodness because sometimes the goodness is badness to someone else. The whole idea of living your truth. Truth it belongs to God, not to you. There is the truth. Semantics matter. Everything belongs to God. So then what do I do with that which God gives me? You live generously. You steward appropriately. You live, you give, and you invest. Those are the three things to do with money. You got to live, right? You need a roof. In this situation, you need one that has windows that can be hurricane-proof, you know, in this world. Nothing wrong with that, having a good residence that can, you know, adequately take care of your family. Absolutely. You need to kind of invest and save, you know, and don't want to just, like, live with no margin. That's not a good situation. But then what do you do? You give to either others or yourself. One is not so much fun for you in the end, and one is. So do the one that is, giving to others. Doesn't mean you don't enjoy. Enjoy all good things that God gives. You've heard me say this a thousand times. But when you make a good thing a God thing, it robs you of the good thing that God intended it for. Because good things only gratify. God only satisfies. And you're made for both, gratification and satisfaction. But what you desperately want, if you have to make a decision between either or, satisfaction is the way to go. Satisfaction endures, sustains. Christ is where satisfaction is found. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead of you. Jesus said this, don't store up for your treasures here on earth where moth eat and rust destroys and thieves break in and steal. But store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust and thieves can't get in there. For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Don't you see that? Where you give is where you, your, your, your little situation here goes. It's where your heart goes. You want joy? Give it to the right place. You want misery? Just keep trying to feed yourself with your stuff. It doesn't work. You're wasting time. Invest your money where it matters. Fourth and finally for this morning, looking at verses 21 and 23, Here's the subtitle to it, I guess. Joy, it's not about where you are or who you're with, but where you're headed and who is Lord. And don't take that out of context. Obviously, where you are, where you hang out matters. Like, context impacts who you become, you know, community. But listen to what this says in verses 21 through 23. Paul's closing this down. He says, Give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me, they also send you some greetings. The rest of God's people send you greetings too. Now listen to this. This is important. Especially those who are in Caesar's household. Why does he make that point? May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Who is Caesar? We haven't talked a lot about him. Caesar Nero, the ruler at this time, his early years of leadership were marked by enhancement of the Roman culture, life, the arts. He was an accomplished singer and musician in his time. He enjoyed athletic competition and took part in chariot races, even winning something at the Olympic Games in Greece. And his regime began with idealism. 
It ended with tyranny. He began murdering anyone who became an obstacle to him staying in power. His victims included his own wife, his mother, his stepbrother, and a biological son. In July of 64 AD, a great fire of Rome broke out that lasted for six days. Rome at that time was organized in 14 districts. Only three of them were not impacted by this fire. And although never proven, some historians believe that Nero may have been responsible for the fire, but like any good leader of politics, I guess, he knew the art of deflection. He took the focus off himself by blaming the fire on Christians whom he tortured and killed. There's a historian that goes by the name Tacitus, and this is what he says and describes the atrocities. He said, covered with the skin of beasts, they, speaking of Christians, were torn by dogs and perished. They were nailed to crosses, or they were doomed to the flames to be burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. What does that mean? Nero used Christians dipping them in hot wax, and he would have these evening garden parties, and I won't go into those dynamics, that are well documented, and he would light them up, and then ride nude in his chariot through his gardens and say, you are the light of the world. And the Christians in Caesar's house say, hey, we love you guys, we're praying for you, we're good. Now, that political dynamic is a little different than yours. And joy for the believer was not found by who is in office or by what's happening in your country. You belong to a kingdom. And when you settle in your heart, first and foremost, that you're a citizen of the kingdom, you become a better citizen of whatever country you're in or whatever business you are employed by or that you employ people through. But don't get the mindset wrong. This world will burn. Have you not read Revelation? Do you not understand that things get darker before the dawn actually comes? What does that mean? Complacency? Just give up? Let it go? Absolutely not. Occupy until Christ comes. Go for it. Live for the hilt. Vote for the people aligned with biblical values. Go for it. But keep your mind steady. There's only one Jesus. And he's coming as a ruler, as the righteous one, as the one who will one day set every wrong right. So where is my joy found? In Jesus The Christians in Caesar's household were able to say, hey, we're good. God bless you. We're praying for you. You still live in one of the most blessed times of Christianity. You have more access to biblical knowledge than any other Christian generation ever. You have more ability to share your faith ever. But give them circus and bread, Nero said. You know how to keep the mob moving forward? Let them stream. Let them eat food that's not food. That's where we are. It's the same tactics as it was 2,000 years ago. The church is designed not to entertain you, but to train you to live well. To live well. Because there are, you know, those that are deceived don't know that they are deceived. That is the point of being deceived. And sometimes those that are, are, are speaking the loudest, and you go, man, that's a lie. They're not individuals necessarily that know the truth and are trying to shroud it from you. Many of them are well-intentioned, thinking they're doing the right thing. But there is an enemy who steals, kills, and destroys. And then there's a God who gives life and life abundantly. And you've heard me say this many times, but our dad growing up every day said, Neil, Jenny, Ryan, God has a plan for your life, but so does the devil. And today's choices follow one of those two plans. Choose well. 
One leads to your death, your destruction, being stolen from. It's a sugar-coated poison apple. Looks good on the outside. Keep licking that thing. It's going to kill you. And then there's the one that looks like living for others, living for God, not having to be the center of attention. And that pathway leads to life over time. Don't play the short game. Play the long game. Deep roots bear and hold much fruit. See, there's a central theme to this book. Jesus is the key to joy. 19 times he talks about it. 16 times he talks about this. This. The secret to Christian joy is found in the way you choose to think. And I want you to do well. I want you to live well. I want you to live well on this side of eternity. And then when you finally meet the face of the voice that we're following, oh, it's a joyous day. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to invite the band up. We're going to close here. But you've seen this slide before, but I'm going to put it up on the screen. The key to joy We know it's Jesus, but how do I connect with him? You need to know him, engage with him, and yield to him. That's how a key is used. You need to know him. This is the way to know him. Be in his word. I wish there was a church that helped daily you be in the word of God. Don't you? There is. Daily, read God's word. Learn it, listen to it, watch it, whatever helps you. Why? So you can be a more knowledgeable sinner. No, so that you can live well. We listen and we learn so we can live well. That's the point of Bible study. And then you need to engage. I won't go into all the G's of how you have a good life. There's seven of them, but I won't go into all of them. It's it's gospel, grow. No, I won't do all that. But you, you... You live a life with Jesus personally and publicly. That's how you engage with the Lord. I wish I could talk about all that, but we don't have time to talk about all that. You engage with him. And the spirit of God's real. He's speaking to your heart. If there's something that goes, man, you need to let this go. You need to get rid of that relationship or stop thinking this way and start engaging with me. Yield to me. You know what? God is still God whether you yield to him or not. It's not like God's like, man, I wish he would recognize my authority. (laughs) He's trying to help you. God doesn't need you. He wants you. And those are the best kind of relationships. The best kind of relationships are like, man, you actually like me. You actually want me. Those are few. Most relationships are based on need. But God says, I don't don't need you. I want you. I want you. I like you. I love you. I care for you. I gave my very best so that you and I can connect. We can have a relationship. But your respect for him does not diminish his glory. He's still God. I just want you to live well. I want you to do well. I want you to have joy. But it is up to you. You have to make your own choices in life. And you've heard this said before. It's not new to me. You make your choices, and then your choices make you. That's how life works. And here's the wonderful thing. If you're alive, which is most of you, it's all of you, obviously, but you still still got time. Let yesterday be yesterday, man. Learn from the past, but don't live there. Live now. The people that are alive are present people, people that know how to live in the moment. They're not irresponsible. Yeah, there's maybe some plans for the future, but nobody knows. Maybe the flight's going to turn around. Who knows? You don't know. But you try and steward things as best as you know how. And you don't repeat mistakes, then they don't become mistakes. They become lifestyle. Okay, I made a mistake. I'm going to learn from that. Welcome to the human race. We all do that. But you must yield to him. You must engage with him. You must know him to have this key unlock a life of joy. This is the last thing I'll say, I promise. It doesn't matter where you're from, who you know, 
what skill sets you have. This doesn't give you a leg up on joy. Everyone comes to the foot of the cross and it's level. There's no zip code envy here. There's no like, well, you don't really, you know, you didn't go to the right school. We all go to the same school. It's called life. And nobody graduates except for Jesus. He's the one who got it. He's the A student. And he just kind of lets us take his report card. That's how it works. It's pretty awesome. Stick and stay with Jesus. He is the key to joy. How? Know him. Engage with him and yield to him. Once a year. And then you're good. No, every day. It's relationship. Spend time with him. Obey him. Let him be God, the master passion in your life. And over time, joy will be yours. Hope, faith, peace, the ability to have self-control, these things that are not available at Wally World, right? Only in God's word and a lifestyle submitted to it. But you can have them. In fact, in my opinion, they're yours. You just got to go for it. And you can do this. You can live life well by the power of his spirit. Don't let the enemy distract you and depress you. Jesus broke the power of sin and the penalty of sin in your life. So live in that power. Be free from that penalty. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you for each person in this room and connected to us in another room. I just pray, God, that you'd be with each person that's here, maybe even listening at a later time or whatever. And Lord, I just pray that you by your spirit would work in them and through them so that they could experience joy to the fullest. God, that their life would be a life of peace and hope and kindness and mercy, long-suffering and self-control and joy. Grow and develop them as they walk with you, I pray in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' glory, amen.